overlooking Phoenix. From high above in the Star Worldwide Network Studios, Badge Boys. Stories, insight, guests, and true blue humor with retired police sergeant Darren Birch and retired police officer Jason Schechterly. And now, here they are, the Badge Boys. Welcome back to another edition of the Badge Boys, the show where two retired cops talk to the community. I'm retired Crime Stopper Sergeant Darren Birch, and unfortunately, not in studio again is Jason Schechterly, who's out inspiring the world uh we love him and we miss him but we're going to just carry on are we not robin absolutely but you always do great shows even if jason's not here well you know we're able to do cops and robin so the second segment (laughs) we're going to have our cops and robin which is always fun to hear uh the tune uh we have a great show because we have two great guests and i mean independently and together both we have josh and karen logan they are married former law enforcement uh she's from chicago he's here locally in arizona where we do our badge boy show uh and they have a a a business guardian training and consulting uh which is amazing fabulous and we'll get to that but before we get into them as a married couple foreign police doing this incredible training keeping the community safe again when you retire when you leave law enforcement it doesn't leave you. So you have that need, that desire to help others, and, and you've turned into a business model, a wonderful business model. Uh, but before we begin and, and talk about the business, which, by the way, uh, Karen is the uh, form, is formerly the chief executive officer. This is your baby, and you just allow him to play. Is that right, Karen? That's correct. Okay. Uh, I just want to get that. You got that, yeah, you got that, that right. Okay. <laughs> I wear the pants in the family, but she's the belt. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You know, and usually it's... Uh, uh, beauty before beast uh, ladies first but i want to talk a little bit about your story because i think it's significant in terms of we start a career because we we have that dna in us and things change and they've changed for you in terms of your law enforcement career what you thought what you were going into and and ultimately what ended up transpiring uh so having said that i want to talk a little bit about josh logan a former police officer for a large metropolitan police department in arizona uh he was also a police officer in north dakota 15 years of law enforcement and military experience combined life-saving awards a police officer of the year uh distinguished graduate of the united states air force which is a branch of military service i believe now uh oh, oh. Uh, sorry i'm an army guy you, you know what like when today. i when i get when i get army guys like that they go well you weren't really in the military I'm like, no, I scored high enough to choose <laughs> oh, on my entry exams. And I love the back and forth. I love it. I but love when it. they attack one of Oh, us, yeah, we will. All in. It, it is. It is. Uh, you uh, were attacked team security for a nuclear weapons convoy, rapid response to nuclear ICBM sites. Uh, you, I could go on and on about your armor and your field training, NRA certified instructor for many things, but we'll probably talk a little bit about that when you go into the Guardian training and consulting because that plays – directly to that uh but if you could the question that we always ask uh and i'll be asking karen this as well what made you want to be a cop in the first place why do you raise your hand and swear an oath and serve something greater than yourself sure i mean i i didn't grow up wanting to be a cop not one i didn't want to be a cop when i was a kid i didn't really know what i wanted to be well i actually did i wanted to join the military and i wanted to be an f-15 pilot my entire life like i wanted to fly be an eagle driver and so uh, fast forward, I was, you know, raised in, in rural Ohio. Um, so, you know, 60 acre horse farm. And then we came out to this wonderful, well, it's not sunny today, but sunny state of Arizona. Typically sunny. Correct. Uh, to get away from the white stuff that we call snow. And uh, I went to ASU and I, that's all I wanted to be was a, was a fighter pilot. And uh, it's funny, I met Jason Sheckerly in 2003 um, at a sociology 101 uh, class. And uh, really, his story really touched me. And, uh, How can it not, right? <laughs> right. I mean, it's it's a, it's an inspiring story. It is, um, you know, of survival and then thrival in life. And so, fast forward, I just realized it, it wasn't the cards for me. Like, uh, I I am not good at math. Like, don't ask me to do math on the show. You're gonna have to edit the living <laughs> crap out of it because it's bad. And I just realized it wasn't the cards. So I joined the United States Air Force, enlisted, raised my right hand. And I wanted to go see the world, like Germany and Asia. And I got sent to Minot, North Dakota. If you don't know where that's at, it ain't. Ex- I do not. It ain't exotic. It ain't. <laughs> okay. There's nothing exotic about it. But it was a blessing in disguise because 
the amount of training that I had, you know, working in a, in a top secret security facility um, and working around nuclear weapons and literally transporting nuclear weapons on city streets from, you know, point A to point B uh, on city streets. It was fun. Um, so I got to, you know, jump out of helicopter, shoot big guns, kick doors, blow and go uh, for four years and get a great amount of training and, and experience. And then with that, because it is their security forces are like their military police for the army. I really got into that law enforcement world and I started, I'm like, this is kind of fun. And I've got like undiagnosed, unmedicated ADHD. So it's right up there for right, me. Right, right, right. That, that adrenaline junkie. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, yeah. You know, like uh, the office, you know, a, a cubicle is like my seventh That's ring hell. of hell. Yeah. It's bad. Yeah, no, totally get that. I, I'm the guy that like running my own company now. I've got like 18 browsers going <laughs> at any given time like that. And it drives Karen freaking nuts. Um, and so... I decided I left the United States Air Force and I joined the Minot Police Department, the city of Minot, about 60 sworn officers. Okay. Um, you know, working for a small agency, um, you do everything. I mean, it, there, there's no ID techs. There's no, you know, forensics. It's, it's literally the patrol officer. And I think at the time we had three detectives, three detectives and 60 sworn. Um, so, you know, it became a very violent city because of uh, the oil they found under Lake Sakakawea. And so they brought in a uh, demographic of, of oil workers called roughnecks. And so we went from like bar fights, guys popping each other on the nose to like stabbing each other and shooting each other. Um, and so for a young police officer, I got exposed pretty darn quick. Um, and then fast forward, um, you know, I had the opportunity to come back to Arizona and, and applied for a large metropolitan agency here. Um, definitely smaller than, you know, Phoenix PD, because um, you're the big dog in the, in the state. And then uh, worked there for a little over 10 years and became a fire instructor, um, FTO, became a field training officer. And then a lot, large part of my, my career was, uh, was working in street crime. So from, you know, the, the simple stuff like dime bags of dope to, to a little larger stuff and then creating CIs. And, a large, and then another large part of that was gang enforcement, working as a gang liaison officer and, and having the opportunity to, to go to comp, gang conferences and talk to the, some of the best you know, the best of the best, you know, learn from like Billy Queen from DEA. And it's just, it was savage. It was great. When you look back at that career, what is the high and what is low? T talk a little bit about that, man. It was, you know, it's, it's funny. You, you mentioned that is, is the highs for me were catching the bad guy. I know that. I know it sounds cliche. Oh, it's not though. We all get it. <laughs> right. Like watching the wolf that has preyed on your society and look at the the sheepdog. We'll just use that sheepdog that looks like the wolf, and that wolf is scared just for a like a millisecond. You see the fear in his eye, his or his or her eyes, that he he put he or she put on society without thinking twice. Correct. And you create. It's not like you're creating fear. It's just more of they're realizing, oh crap, this is this is the reality. Like I got caught, and it's just chasing that high after high after high. And I, I loved it. I, I, you know, that's what I did for a living. I didn't hand out sticker badges. I didn't, you know, do that. I, I went out and worked the streets, whether in the blue suit or, you know, some plain clothes work here and there. But it was, it was just fun. And she just chasing bad guys. Like it, it's, you know, and, and it's not like this virtuoso, like, you know, this, you know, taking crime, the crime on, you know, the war on crime. It was just more of like, I just had fun yeah. playing cops and robbers. It's a fun, you know, there's no greater job. <laughs> Right. No greater job. There really isn't. And you're doing good at the same time. But yeah. it takes a certain individual to do that. Oh, absolutely. And it, it's, I have a lot of friends that are trying to get into law enforcement. And it, it's like, it just takes a certain person. And being a field training officer, you quickly learn that. Because you're like, you're in the, like I had to learn, I'm like, I'm in the passenger seat as a veteran police officer. And there's this kid, because he's a kid, he or she's a kid. They look like they're 12 and they're like the make-a-wish kid that want to be a cop for a day. <laughs> and it says, serving since breakfast. And he's like, I'm going to go 130 miles an hour in a Tahoe. And you're like, we're going to die. Like, and, uh, and you got to see really that raw sense of it. And, you know, some people had it and you being any, any field training officer to work their weight in salt, you either see it or you're like, this is just not for yeah, you. There's no shame. And this isn't the no. right job. There's no, no shame no. in that. Yeah. No, anybody can be a firefighter. So exactly. <laughs> and with better benefits. Correct. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, which means you're half time of a plumber or a that's right. Worker. That's right. It's your uh, side job. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was just fun. The, the, the lows to answer your question, yes. um, was the aft, like, it, you know, it's funny. We, Karen and I, when we talk to a lot of like groups now in our, our world that we live in, um, you know, Karen and I explained to people that, you know, we're very comfortable with violence and people just go, Whoa, like, hold on a second. I said, no, understand this. 
I've seen violence firsthand and acted on other people. I have enacted righteous violence to protect my community and, and my family and, and all of that. Um, I have, uh, I've had violence enacted on me, right? I mean, it, the amount of street fights that I've been in. Um, so the, I've had violence enacted on me, all those three things. And I've seen the aftermath of all of that firsthand, not something we read in a book or watched on a YouTube channel. Um, or, you know, we watched the, the body worn camera footage, like you, all three of us, we've lived that. Like it, that resonates to that. But with all of that, it, with all that experience, it makes me very comfortable with it. And I, and with all of that, it's like you come up to my driveway with ill intent to harm my queen or my, my princess, I'm going to be very comfortable with it. But the last person that wants that violence is me because I've seen it. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's no offense. Like when these people like talk about these esoteric conversations about violence and they're like, this is what it all, no, it's not. And when they see the body worn camera footage, they're like, that doesn't look good. I'm like, it shouldn't, it's called violence. Yeah. But then, and that's where the really, the aftermath of the violence and how much damage like it's caused to me, my, my personal life, my, just my life in general. Um, that's the, really the lows, uh, you know, when you're alone, um, there may be alcohol involved or, or whatever the case may be. And, and it's that self-medication that, and you hate to use the word medication. You're kind of using air quotes. Yeah, but yeah, it is. It you're is. self-medicating to trying to avoid yeah. dealing with it. And it's yeah. the quiet rooms, yeah. like the quiet rooms are the loudest. And so, um, you know, it's, and that's where the lows came in. And, you know, there were, I've had, I had my fair share of, uh, how do I say wrestles with the admin, you know, the administration. And it, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's a struggle to know that you did everything right. And there are people that are second guessing you. We, it's, we it's live bad. in a political world, uh, especially now. Oh, yeah. um, and you left about what, what year? Uh, let's see. I left. What was it three years ago, babe? 2020. 2020. 2020. Okay. Yeah. yeah so January, my God, January 2020. 2020. Yeah. Right yeah. before I mean, all the right craziness started that, with. I don't know and, if you heard of it. COVID. I don't know if you've yeah, heard of that. something about summer love. I heard. <laughs> um, and what's funny about that is, as horrible as the summer of 2020 was, which we mm-hmm. talk, I talk probably way too much about because it just bothers me today sure. because we're seeing the ramifications from it today. But really, in 2014, when a certain organization came, there was a lot of um, animosity towards police. There was a lot of political handpicking of DAs. There was a lot of things that was done that politicized the city structures to the point where city council uh, was directing law enforcement in a certain way. And we saw that it finally explode, if you will, in 2020. Let's take this to talk about why you left and what you end up doing and how you met this beautiful woman to your left. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, you know, fast forward in through my career. Um, I always taught um, because I always had a passion for teaching and I really love, love what I do. My dad, you know, it's, I grew up, my dad was a radio DJ. So like being in this studio brings back, comfortable. oh yeah, it just brings back the smell of the foam. Like it's something about <laughs> it. Like it's just, you know, my dad worked for at anywhere from six to eight radio stations over his career. So I, you know, the, the power of communication, my dad gave me that at a very uh, young age and it's a blessing to say for the least, which creates the gift of gab. Um, and so the uh, so fast forwarding, I, I started teaching um, at a, at a local gun range, and um, while I was still a police officer, so it was just kind of like side job. I, I just enjoyed it, got a couple extra bucks, and uh, I enjoyed it. And so then fast forwarding through my career, then I get to be a, to be an easy post firearm instructor, and then patrol rifle instructor, FTO, and and getting all the law enforcement side in addition to the civilian side, and I just really enjoyed it. I just really really did, and it was fun. And, you know, my, most of my clients on, when on the side job waved at me with all five fingers instead of one. So I wasn't That's getting, always nice. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I may have guns pointed at me by, by my clients accidentally instead of like, hey, punk, uh, you know, hey, police, right? Um, so as I, as I fast forward through that, um, you know, at multiple critical incidents in my career, um, and it just, just some, you know, it's a crazy to think that some people just don't want to go to jail. Like you actually have to force them to go to jail. And so, uh, so then, you know, go through a really bad critical incident, uh, pretty darn bad. And then a lawsuit, $4 million lawsuit. Wow. Um, and it, it, it tore me up pretty darn, darn good. And then my personal life just completely fell apart. Um, and my daughter at the time was four, tore my life apart. And, uh, and then, you know, I was still teaching on the side. And then uh, this lovely lady uh, walked through the door. Uh, you know, I, I was like, what a, did I look like a sad puppy dog? Is that... I, possibly. I mean, I have a thing for rescuing 
you know, I have a pit bull, <laughs> I have a pit bull rescue, so there's something yeah. wrong with me, too, so. because I feel like I have to rescue She rescued things. dogs, and then she rescued this dog. Um, and so... Um, I met her, I met Karen, uh, my wife, and now wife, at, at local gun range. We were just teaching, and and uh, I was like, okay, what's her background? Um, and it's just you know, again, we're going to get to it. It's it's impressive, and uh, and she doesn't look half that bad either. So uh, you know, you're you married on well. Eyes. You married above your status. Oh, one hundred percent. Don't say that. That's the part you're not supposed <laughs> Is that to say. That was the That's secret. Inside yeah. voice. <laughs> <laughs> you just gave up. <laughs> Don't reconsider anything after the show, please, babe. <laughs> And, uh, and so, yeah, we just hit it off and we realized like there's demographics, you know, that, that like, it's not that I can't teach women. Right. Um, but Karen's better at it. There's something about, and it's also about the customer. Sometimes they feel more comfortable. Exactly. Yeah, right. I don't take I a did person. That sex crimes. Absolutely. Exactly. They may want a female police officer, right? Yeah. Yeah. Talking about those parts can be uncomfortable. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's important. And, and it's on their dime. So yeah, the right? customer's always right. Exactly. And I think this is a perfect time to bring in Karen, uh, founder, sure. chief executive officer of, uh, again, Guardian Training and Consulting. Uh, incre- you're right. Uh, you're absolutely right, Josh. Uh, a career with the Chicago Police Department, 11 years, and with a federal air marshal, uh, 10 years. Uh, during that time, she worked playing closed uh, tactical team, uh, the Marine helicopter unit, which was uh, a attachment to the air marshals at that time. She was certified advanced open water, dry suit, and scuba rescue and recovery diver, as well as U.S. Coast Guard certified merchant marine officer again. Uh, during her tenure, as with the air marshal service she traveled the world amassing over two million miles talk about uh, air miles right wow good credit card on that uh providing <laughs> co- covert security and safety to countless passengers and airline crew so i you know i want to thank both of you for coming uh but i've never had an air marshal so i'm really kind of excited to talk to you about that but first i have to start where we started with josh why do you want to be a police officer with chicago Oh, wow. Um, Well, there are a couple of things I think that happened when I was young where, you know, maybe the seed was planted and my dad was ended up being 32 years Chicago, uh, retired Chicago. That could do it. (laughs) Yep. So he when I was a year old, he joined the police academy. And so I kind of grew up with him being gone and putting on the uniform and stuff. So I think just maybe subconsciously it was always there. And I always tell this story in our intro that I think I was about seven or eight and I grew up in the neighborhood where the Chicago White Sox play. So there was always a lot of hubbub in my neighborhood, you know, it was a lot of, you know, if the Yankees came to town, it was always a big deal. There's a lot of tourists that were in my neighborhood and we lived literally within walking distance. And I remember it was a playoff game or something big and the mounted unit was there. So it was the horses from, you know, the Chicago PD and as a young girl, which I think most young girls like horses and ponies, and they, they grow up thinking, you know, I'm going to have a horse when I get older. And your parents are always like, yeah, okay, you can do that when you get older. Um, and I thought, I looked, my dad was holding my hand, and we were getting ready to cross the street. And I saw the majestic horses sitting there. And I thought, that's what I want to do when I get older. And I literally said that. And can you imagine the horror in my dad's face? I was seven or eight. And he just kind of looked at me and said, oh, you know, you have to be a cop for a really long time before you can make it to a unit like that. And so I can sit here and say that's where it, you know, was the big, yeah, but maybe not. Maybe I was just thinking at that age, wow, I could ride horses in the city streets and that would be awesome. I could be a cop too. (laughs) Um, But, but I can also tell you later on in life, uh, maybe a few years after that, uh, you know, growing up on the city streets of Chicago, we we used to play cops and robbers and tag and hide and seek and all those things that the kids today don't do because they're, on their video games. Um, We were playing around, uh, just kind of chasing each other in the streets, honestly. And there were um, plastic bags sitting, like garbage bags sitting on the sidewalk. And we were jumping over them and stepping on them. And we realized, sadly, we ended up realizing there was a, there was a body in those bags. It was chopped up into pieces. And how horrific is that for a child to have to go through? And we, I don't think I ever really learned what who that was or what happened there. And that was kind of devastating because the police, you know, had to interview all of us and they were asking us all these questions. And I think it started to, pl- again, planting those little seeds. Um, another quick story. I was 16. My friends and I had our, um, we had our permits to drive and we, in order to get to certain neighborhoods, you had to go through certain pockets of bad neighborhoods. And we thought it would be really cool to stop at the McDonald's 
um, that was in a not so great area in town. And I think there were four or five of us and we came out of the McDonald's and there were a few young boys that were standing out there waiting for us. And it was kind of like a conga line they, We walked out and they started shoving us and pushing us and trying to take our stuff. And we all had, I grew up in an Italian and, uh, a Hispanic neighborhood. So we would have like the little gold chains and the little, you know, the, I'm not Italian, but we had like the horn and all these little things that we used to wear and they got ripped off of our necks. And, um, I think it was those times where I thought I felt victimized, you know, like people do when they get their house burglarized, they feel like, Oh man, I feel vulnerable. And I feel it just really pissed me off that, these kids would do that to us. And that's when I realized maybe not everyone's so friendly and you have to kind of keep your head on a swivel and you have to watch out and be careful and protect yourself and protect your friends. And you know, that I think those were, it's a kind of a long answer, I guess, but those were the, those were the things that transition ends up becoming who you are opposed to that aha moment kind of thing. Right. And then one other one, I, <laughs> there was a bowling alley in my neighborhood where all of our parents would go bowling. And then right across the street was a restaurant. We'd go over there and get like an order of fries or something, bring them back to the bowling alley. And as I was standing in there, I witnessed an armed robbery. And it was an older white guy, bald. And I, I was standing there and all of a sudden I see the gun and he's like, give me all the money, like right out of the registers, like something you would see on TV. And I froze and I could barely see over the counter. And again, it was one of those times where, I mean, you're introduced to these horrifically bad things. And again, here I am being, you know, interviewed by the police as a witness. And what did you see? And I remember running to the door after he ran out, which is crazy because I think it was 10 at the time. I ran to the door to see where he was going. And I was looking and at the car. DNA. I gave a description of the vehicle and the plate. And I don't, again, I didn't follow up on it. I was too young to figure out what the heck was going on with the court trial and whatever happened to that guy. But those were all the things that I can think of that I grew up and I'm like, you know what? I really need to, I really need to explore this and see if it's something that, you know, I'd like to do as a living and I don't know, justification or, you know, trying to keep people in check or help in society. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. 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 I mean, let's face it we're very lucky what we do right now. And it kind of segues into what what we're doing now. But um, I just felt like, you know, growing up in a big city, there's so many people. And that's what I see today too. Like these big inner cities are just, it's too many people trying to do too many things and the politics involved. And it's, it's hard to keep things on track and things just get chaotic. Yeah. We need, we need the good people like yourself, your father, your husband, right? Law and order. Right. I mean, that's what it comes down to. It's like, it does. That's why it's a thin blue line. And there, that thin blue line is the few of us that can do this job and do it effectively. Keep our wits about us. Uh, talk about the transition to air marshal, because that's fascinating to me because you know, that's not, we don't know much about that world. Right. So I can tell you, um, the day that, I thought I wanted to do something bigger, better, more was actually on 9-11. And it's funny now when we talk about it, there are kids that we encounter, uh, especially sometimes in our classes, they weren't even born yet on 9-11, right? Today, you're correct. It's it's scary how few, how many of the youth that are going to be taking over the world, if you will, don't have that appreciation. Right. And, you know, a lot of times, like, especially people in our generation, especially law enforcement, and I know it affected everyone in this country the same, but especially if you're fire or, or, or police, it, it really kind of had a profound effect. And I had that burning desire that I wanted to be there to help. Wow. Um, but on 9-11, I was driving to work. It was 7, 8 in the morning, and I was working in the commander's office, so I had a, a desk job at the time. It was summer furlough, so I was off the streets for a few months just to help out with the, the old-timers that go on vacation in the summers. Gotcha. I, I, gotcha. Got to work, I got to work inside TDY. for a couple months, yeah. <laughs> and I was driving to work, and I was listening to Mankow Muller, of all guys. He's uh, very similar to probably what Dave does here in Arizona, just a local um, guy. And, you know, I listen to him every morning, and and they were all in the studio, and, and I, they must have got a fax or something, and they said, um, they started talking amongst each other, did you guys see this? Is this for real? It was a printout of one of the planes that had hit the towers, and they were just kind of talking about it. They thought they, you know, they weren't sure if it was for real. And then they started talking about something else, and they were like, can someone check on this? Like, what's going on? And it was real time. Yeah. 
And as I was driving, and I'm getting like the hair standing up on my arm right now. Um, as I was driving, they all started screaming in the studio, live, uh, real time. Guttural. And that was when the second plane hit the second tower. Yeah. And I thought, oh my God. And being in Chicago with the Sears Tower at the time, under the call it the Willis Tower now, but it was the Sears we Tower at the Sears, time. Right. Thank you. And I, I thought, oh my God, we're under attack. This is crazy. Yeah. And so as I was driving in, I just kept looking at the Sears Tower thinking, is this going to be next? So in the time that it took me to get to the commander's office, I ran upstairs and they were all watching it on TV. Yeah. And that's the exact time that the third plane hit the Pentagon. And the commander was literally like, oh, my God, we have to come up with a plan. So we, everyone went and got their their uh, riot helmets and all of this stuff. And I was there when he was trying to decide what to do and how to rally everybody. And they were all, all the commanders were talking to one another and – that's when um, the fourth plane crashed in Pennsylvania. And so, again, it goes back to we were all watching it. We were all there. We all know where we were that day. Yep. And I thought that's another seed that was planted. And I'm like, this is crazy. You know, I love working in Chicago. Um, it's it's the place that I grew up, and I'll probably spend the rest of my life here. Um, and then I think it was a month later, I ended up going down to the first district, which is the downtown district, because they were getting all those like anthrax calls. Do you guys remember do, any of that? I stuff? do. The, the, mails, the suspicious yeah. packages, packages and sure. they needed help in the downtown area. So I went there. And then in that time, that's when the Marine unit had called um, because I had taken that test years prior. Um, one of the prerequisites for the Marine unit, which is Chicago's version of the Harbor Patrol. Okay. Um, there's 30 miles of lakefront, Lake Michigan, that runs up and down the, the shores of Chicago. <laughs> yeah, downtown Chicago. So um, I ended up getting called for that because I had boating experience and scuba experience, and th that was part of the deal. You had to have some seniority plus those two things, and I, you know, I was like, I'm going. Um, at the time, I was <laughs> – so September 11th of 2001, so I was getting married – my first marriage was September 29th of 2001, so 18 days after. Uh, I'm, I'm doing the math right. Is that 18 days after? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 18 days after I was supposed to get married. So that was kind of a mess. Uh, started off that marriage on a really kind of a weird note. Um, so it took me a while to get to the Air Marshal Service, long story short. I didn't go to the Marine Unit. I worked there for five years, and then I decided that was the time I needed to leave. I wasn't married. Or I ended up getting a divorce. Uh, wasn't married. Had no kids, and I I just had a calling. I, yeah. I wanted to apply. And then thought back to that nine eleven, like directly helped in right. that it, capacity. It took me a five years to get there. Gotcha. Because right after nine eleven, a lot of the guys from you know military guys and a lot of the you know, border patrol, you had a lot of guys that went over right away. Yeah. Took me a minute to get there, but I always had that in the back of my mind, and then I was free to do so. At the time, I was getting married, probably thinking about, oh, I got to settle down and have some kids here. I can't be thinking about running around. And then as a divorcee, I was free to do that. So just kind of backtracking there. It, it worked. Life worked. It worked. Let me ask you that. Before I, we transition to the Guardian Training and Consulting uh, and your love of your life, uh, I got to ask you about the air marshal. Is there a story? Was it boring as all get out? Yes. What flight after flight after flight, nothing going on, uh, maybe a baby crying? Or do you have some you know, experiences? Because 10 years, correct? 10 years total. Um, quick backstory on when I got hired, they, um, I, you know, I had all my experience from the Chicago PD and I was always a good shot. I could shoot really well, but when you're Chicago PD or any big department, they just want you to qualify and then they don't care. Get back out on the street where, where you belong. Right. But when I became an air marshal, I had a lot of uh, learning to do. It's, it's, you know, it's at air marshal 101. It's a lot of federal law. It's a lot of different tactics, but I was always really good at all of it. And I flew around for the first three years, hardcore, a lot of internationals. And um, I, I always shot really well. And I think that's when I was out of the New York field office, by the way, where I had a lot of really good mentors and instructors there. And that's when they decided, you know, Karen's doing, she does really well at all of this stuff. We should probably pull her in. We've never had a female instructor before. So let's, why don't we send her to IDC instructor development course. Let's send her down to Fletzy and get her certifications and all of these things. And so it was about the three year mark when you get a little burned out because you're flying constantly. They do five on, two off, wow. which is a little crazy. And, you know, we could talk about that 
you know, about the Air Marshal National Council. That's kind of like our um, union, so to speak. They're kind of helping the, the air marshals keep them on track so they don't run us into the ground, so to speak. Um, but we, yeah, we, we flew around. It was, it was a lot of, um, grueling days and nights. Um, a lot of canceled flights. They'd still make you sit there and wait, you know, you'd have to work 10 hour days and stuff. And, uh, so I got a break, um, after the three year mark, they sent me to firearm school and I came back and I was able to actually just teach and, and stay on track there. So I got a big break, but then I went back to flying again. So every quarter I got a break, but still 1.9 million miles to be exact is, is what I ended up flying in that 11 year period. And I talked with Josh about the high and lows, and I'm going to take the lo lows as the, the hours and the, the hectic nature of the schedule uh, with a nice break of training, which is a great segue for uh, the Guardian. But was there a particular high in terms of an arrest or something that stands out in terms of that 10 year career with the air marshals? Well, fortunately for me, it was a very um, uneventful Which is a time. A good thing. It was a good thing, and it's so different than being a street cop. You yeah, know, you're not exactly. making arrests. You're not Thank there. You. You're, but you do a ton of training in the simulator, um, and we use um, simunitions, so we were able to actually shoot at each other with using the simunitions. That was really good, realistic training. Because you can't avoid it. They, right. they force you to stand in a box and you cannot move and you and have to learn how to fight back. It's and funny how real that is. It, Having it with is. Phoenix, we also have, you know, fifth largest department. We also have, you know, simulators. And, and it's amazing how you, having been in, having been shot three times, how realistic those scenarios are. Right. And I think this is a great segue to go into guarding, which is about training and consulting. And how did that develop? I know you guys met in a... Shooting range. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Please, Josh. Yeah, so, uh, um, you know, we, we worked. It, it only took me about half my life to realize I don't work well for people, but I really work well with people. Um, I, I, I realized, and I think it's my dad as well, um, that the entrepreneur mindset. And uh, so we were working for this local gun range, and, and Karen and I were just teaching together, and it, it just really clicked. Like, she can reach a demographic that better than I can, and I can reach certain demographics better then she can. I mean, you know, in law enforcement, it's a perfect marriage, you know, no pun intended. Yeah. Right. And it's, and it's, you know, law enforcement is a very male dominated world. Right. And, and there's a lot of misogyny and chauvinism and narcissism, and smart, and, smart departments. Oh my God. Egos. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like little boys club. Oh yeah. And yeah. so, and so what we realize, like I can walk in and set the tone really easily and it's not that she can't do it. It's just, I could do it better in that way. And then when she's teaching women, I'm not the bearded, you know, dude that like, how do you relate to me? Um, and so what we realized there was a recipe there and, and it wasn't anything bad. It was just, we just wanted to do our own thing. And, and that's where guardian you know, was really started. We, it was kind of started on a, like a cocktail napkin and we were just kind of like, okay, what do we want to do? Your first date, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, actually our first date was a Glock seven. We fell in love over Glock 17 gen, uh, well, who's, gen five. Who doesn't? True right? story. And she shot better than me <laughs> and she shot better than me. And he handled I it. I hear really... you laughing over there. And that meant something, <laughs> didn't it? It meant it was huge for yeah. me. It, he wasn't intimidated by yeah. it. And he actually was like, that's, that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. cool. Right. The yeah. man card kind of got punched at first, but then I'm like, that's insanely hot. I want to date it. And I right? eventually married right? it. So, <laughs> and I got a hardware and a software upgrade. And so, um, um, so we, well, that was just the, the genesis of it was just doing what we wanted to kind of do our vision of it. And I, I worked for a lot of different training companies outside of the, the local gun range. And I, I could see what worked and what didn't work. And I got a lot of exposure on big companies that failed, small companies that failed and kind of everything in between. And a majority of them really just kind of failed and floundered. And so I had a lot of experience in failures and seeing how, and I'm like, you know, we're going to do this together. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to figure it out. And collectively, you have so much training in such a vast array of yeah. a world in terms of, you know, local, small departments, sure. larger departments, major departments, federal departments. So all that vast training, I can't help but think it gives you so much to feed upon and 
disseminate. Talk about what mission you provide and sure. specifically what you do. Yeah, so I mean, Karen and I are, I guess, proverbially the face of Guardian, um, you know, but we have a whole staff. Like I, my director of medical operations, Tim Freund, uh, I know Tim. Medic. Yeah, yeah, Tim, you know Tim. Right. Right. With Blue Heart. Tim, so he, yeah, he's oh, he works for amazing. us. So he, you know, he'll tell you straight up, he's like, he's a man of many hats. Yes. Um, that's the most Christian thing I can say about it. But uh, <laughs> but like he, uh, Tim is one of the most savage, nice educators and just knowledgeable. So he oversees our whole medical division. So our Stop the Bleed programs, our Narcan, sadly, we have to talk about Narcan now. Huge. It's a reality. Huge. Uh, I don't sadly, want, forever, yeah, I think. Yeah. And so that's not, it's not coming down anytime no. soon. And so our Stop the Bleed, our Narcan and our CPR courses, we do TAC med classes as well. So, uh, so we have like our most, the majority of our clientele are just John Q public. Um, you know, people like right now, a lot of clientele are what brings you to guardian? They slide the gun case across the table. I open it up. The gun's still wrapped in plastic and the receipts on top. And they're like, I have no clue how to use this. And they're being responsible. And in today's owners. world, it, it's, it's sadly the crime. And we'll be talking about that in our next segment, sure. but with the crime rising, people are realizing I need to, I need protection. So yep. they're getting good protection training yep. from and not experts. Being a, exactly. And not being a vigilante, but like, listen, you come to my family. I'm, I'm going to have, I'm going to protect it. Um, and so a lot of people are coming to that realization. And, and so obviously the firearm side of the game is, is what we do is one side of it. It's a huge part. And then the, the, the medical side of the game as well. Um, and then active shooter response. So both her, uh, Karen and I are both uh, active shooter uh, instructors as well. And environmental awareness. Yeah. So situational awareness. Karen's doing a free, uh, a free seminar at the 511 Tactical Store. This month. Yeah. And on the 23rd. And so like it's, and that's just awareness. None of it yeah. involves the pew things, you know, the bang bangs. It's, it's just listen to that inner voice correct mm -hmm. yeah, trust you see something trust yeah uh, huge huge and so training. it's not sexy it's not instagram sexy because we're but it's but it's real world and it can be life-saving 100 percent. tell us how we can find out more information sure. about guardian training and consulting. so uh, our website is readytoday.org so if you go to readytoday.org um the, and then it'll go to our website you can contact us uh, by our website they'll have a contact us Sign up for our, obviously our, our email list because we continually put out courses. Um, but a lot of stuff we do is, is, is customized as well. So, and is customized. it local only, or do you have zoom? Can you talk a little about yeah. how they can get this training? So it's multifaceted. So the, we have our, our scheduled classes, but then, um, we do custom classes where we go to people's churches or, or homes. Um, I do a lot of zoom seminars, violent encounters and aftermath countering the mass shooter, uh, threat. So there's a lot of zoom seminars that don't involve those seminars don't involve hands-on firearm destruction. So that's where we can uh, scale that training. But then we're doing, we have 20 courses now that are AZ post certified. So it's, we're now we're getting in the law enforcement world as well. So it's just, I always tell people to get a hold of us and we'll do what we can to help you. Love it. And one more time. The contact info readytoday.org and then just uh just get a hold of us and then or you can uh, call us at 480-331-4192 fantastic uh are you guys going to stick around for our next segment sure. cops and We're, robin the yeah. boss says yes yeah, then it's a it. yes that i love fun. it <laughs> thank you boss we'll be right back more stories inside guests and true blue humor coming up on batch boys we'll be back right after this if you like the Badge Boys, you'll love their books, starting with Burning Shield, the Jason Schechterly story, which Arizona Diamondbacks president Derek Hall proclaimed, Jason is an inspiration and his story must be read and shared. The professionally written novel is a powerful biography chronicling Jason's gut-wrenching battle to health after being trapped in a fireball that consumed his police car and his high-stakes legal showdown against the Ford Motor Company for their explodingly lethal Crown Victoria police cruisers. Then there's Darren's award-winning Twisted But True book trilogy with close to 100 compelling and funny true crime stories that American Detectives with Lieutenant Joe Kenda producer called The Perfect Blend of Humor, Heroism, and Honor. And retired Colonel Dave Grossman declared, Darren's Twisted But True books are hilarious, deep, and powerful. Each book in the series received the Pinnacle Award for the best true crime book, and a story from book two was featured on an ID Channel television show. And Robin's most recent book, Soul Stirrings, reviewed as an often humorous and spiritually uplifting story of a widow's soul-searching pilgrimage to the afterlife. Darren called it a love story, a ghost story, an investigative story. It's a story like no other. And Robin's first book, Victim No More, 
where she shares her harrowing experiences with rape and domestic violence as Robin takes the reader on a very personal journey through the morass of abuse and loss, and ultimately, survival. These Badge Boy books should be on everybody's top 10 reading list. You're listening to Badge Boys with retired police sergeant Darren Birch and retired police officer Jason Schechterly. Now, back to the Badge Boys. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Robin, that was so much fun. You oh my kind of chimed in and kind of told uh, Josh what a, a stud, but what an incredible <laughs> alpha uh, Karen is, quite frankly. She's uh, awesome. The, you know, the whole, the, we've said this before, at least I've said it on the show just a few episodes ago. I really adore Badge Boys to the point where you guys bring so many retired and guys still on duty, women on duty as well, and they are so vulnerable in their strength being able to talk about things. But my God, you know, he's sitting here and he just like, it, it's like him telling a story and he's just right there. It's all get real in your face. And then she comes on. I mean, these are two people that are literally badasses as human beings and people who have worn a badge so to me i feel grateful that you know i've had the chance to meet them before and it's kind of cool i didn't know they were coming in today till the last minute so i, I was I, surprised i do have to tell the uh, listening audience we met them at a griffith blue heart event and yes. we've had um obviously uh, uh gr- you know the griffith blue heart entire staff here i think i think they've all been here at one time um but as much as we love brandon we got to meet this couple and they shined and we said wow you gotta have you on the show and it just took some time and thank you for your patience and then finding out his dad was a radio personality it's like (laughs) oh i know right and he's got he's got the gold behind the mic i mean (laughs) (laughs) um you know this is the perfect segment for a beautiful song because we're all kind of doing a kumbaya right now and we need a really fun song to kind of just kind of hit it home he rocks in the treetop all the day long hopping and a bopping and a singing his song all the little birds on jaybird street love to hear the robin go tweet 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 rock and robin yeah, that means it's uh, absolutely cops and robin and robin <laughs> you have some headlines for us do you not i do i do boy these are some doozies Man arrested after intentional act of crashing minivan into Philadelphia police headquarters. Yeah, I don't know if you guys heard this. Uh, I'm sure you have. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was, again, the key word is intentional. Uh, I was surprised by two things on this headline, and I'll go for a minute, and then I'll give it to both of you. I was surprised there wasn't the barriers. Uh, I saw the location. I didn't see everything that we learned from 9-11. We talked a lot about 9-11. Uh, I didn't see those barriers it, it, to stop this type of event, which quite frankly surprised me. I'm not trying to throw down Philly at all. It could have been a small little substation, you know, community-driven, and just didn't foresee this. But uh, it, my understanding was one of the main Boroughs and, and that you know not the headquarters but a uh, um, you know a station so that surprised me number sure. one but it did not surprise me somebody doing this we've seen officers intentionally run over uh, we've seen um, the you know we've seen so many intentional targeted acts against police officers and again I still believe this is still fallout from 2020 and the hatred the demonization is fueled regular people let alone those with behavioral health issues yeah and i I would even push that back a little more uh after you know ferguson the 21st century policing um you know like or hate that whole thing um there was a paradigm shift in law enforcement after uh the ferguson incident um you know and and the 21st century policing gets released and iacp gets involved and they do what they do I wouldn't say best, but it is what it is. Um, and then, you know, fast forward to to George Floyd and, and, and the summer of quote unquote summer love. But yeah, like it doesn't surprise me, um, but it, it also doesn't surprise me that they didn't have anything in place. That doesn't I'm, surprise you. No, it, it, it you know, I'm going to and I don't mean to throw law enforcement under the bus, but the problems we're seeing in law enforcement are directly correlated to a lack of training. So uh, police departments not spending the money. And what's the first time. thing that you lose when you defund a police department? What's training. the first thing? Training, training, right? Because, you know, you look at the, the aspect of training, right? The biggest hindrance for law enforcement training are money or staffing. That's usually the case, right? We can afford it, but I can't afford to take cops off the road to go to this training. Um, the second thing is, well, you just don't have the money, right? Well, you do have the money. You, you just, you're just not budgeting it. That's fine. Um, but the biggest thing is we're seeing right now 
we're paying the dues for for the unknown dues, right? For lawsuits and 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 all of these different things that the in you know the the running through the the uh, the the police station, we're paying the dues for what we haven't been paying for decades for decades of training. So because they're like, well, I can't spend fifty thousand dollars on this training. It's like this, but if you don't train them, then how much are you going to pay on the back end of lawsuits? Or workman's comp, right? And and medical bills and, for these officers. And this is budget 101. I mean, yeah, it, it, it is. It, it, plumbing commercials say, pay me now or pay me a lot later. I mean, it's exactly. that simple. Exactly. Uh, please. Yeah, yeah so... Ahead. So I see it on a larger scale. I look at things like um, our, like our high-level politicians. So I blame it on the media, first of all. But they're getting their messaging from the high-level politicians. So call me a conspiracy theorist. But in my when I see stories like that and I see people acting out in this way, I think that our high-level politicians are trying to weaken us as a country. I look divide at divide us divide, without a doubt. Absolutely, coming from a, a town uh, sh- like Chicago where everything's Democrat, Democrat, Democrat. That's how you vote. We don't talk politics; you just do it because that's what we're told. Um, they keep you in this bubble, right? So I look at it on a worldly scale where our high-level politicians are just trying to weaken us at a, a as a country, trying to disrupt the fabric of society. Because think about it: if we were all on the same page, all of us. What, what, how many, what is it, 300 million in the United States? 300 million? Of sure, we'll go with that. Yeah. I think in one. In one. Baby just got born. Right. <laughs> if we were all on the same page and thought similarly, how powerful would we be? We'd be. So and it's they very be. important for them to keep us divided, to keep control. That's their power base, dividing True. us and giving them talking points and, keep, right. and not fixing anything. Right. Uh, the next headline, please. Oh, yeah. Well, this one's going to be a combination one because it has to do with New York City. Record-breaking resignations at NYPD and also record-breaking crime in New York City goes yeah. hand in hand. And, no. and one thing that you I want really to hit home with this is that when they say stats, many times they'll say, compare 23 to 22. And that's not fair. We need to compare it to when things Decades. were... Thank you. When thank pre-20 and post-20 and when you look at the resignations in new york city and there's i don't know it's like last year it, it, to this year it's like i don't know 32 percent increase but it's 117 percent increase right. from the year before that mm-hmm. during that two-year period so it's getting exponentially worse when you have these big increases the next year should be if if it's just because of the Attrition. Flows, yeah, no. thank you, no. then it would maintain, and Correct. it doesn't. It keeps going up. This is okay. horrific. And this, again, goes back to why I think things in terms of post-20 and, and past-20, in regards to things changed. There was the incredible paradigm shift. Now, granted, we can talk about the Ferguson effect. You can talk about um, Trevor Martin. You can talk about these things where things were changing. BOM got involved in 2014. Mm -hmm. So we can look at those things, but really that crescendo of hatred that was spewed upon law enforcement as a whole, not bad cops, because we oh the one thing everyone agreed on was George Floyd, that was a murder. Sure. I, mean, I, I have not talked to a single police officer post or, you know, prior that thought that that was justified. It, it was horrible. And instead of using that as a rallying cry, a Martin Luther King Jr. moment to com, you know get everyone on the same sheet of music and say yes, it was used to divide. To Correct. your point, Karen. So uh, so uh, this is is it's a big ship. What happened in 2020, the demonization, all the Ds, this dismantling of police departments, the demonizations, the demoralization, the destruction, ultimately the, the funding, which is all those things okay. wrapped in a nice package. That is a huge ship to turn around, and it's like a, a, a big old jet airliner. It's not going to turn around <laughs> no. and, and, and do the air marshal uh, <laughs> analogy there. It's a good pun. Yeah, you can't turn it in a heartbeat. So it's no. going to take a while. And we, But we need to stay focused on it. Please. I mean, realistically, who wants to be a cop right now? I mean, I, let's just cause just call let's just call it for what it is. Who wants to be a cop right now? Um, it's because we have we live in a fishbowl. Every we we have split second. We have to make split second decisions. That is U.S. Supreme Court case law. And then now we're looking at it from hindsight, and we can go spend days, months, years, right, decades to 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 analyze that. 
And it's it's terrible. And then to lose qualified immunity in some places? Oh, that's scary. Oh my God. That's scary. And then the other aspect is if you look at New York, right, and you look at that with the whole the whole vaccination thing where they where people just walked off the job and then the US Supreme Court came down and said, No, 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 no. They get their jobs back. Then you go back to your job and what do you what would do you do you wanna work in that environment? And then you just go like this, you know what? I got fired because I wouldn't get vaccinated. So I'm gonna now take the reins and leave. So you fired me, you have to reinstate me. I get my money back. And then I, I get a lot of training. I can go to a smaller department if I, I even go, want to do that. And I go deuces out. So yeah. I just go. So it's, it's, it's crazy. And I, I, can, I can only guess that that's what they probably did, right? They got their jobs reinstated. They looked around and go, why am I still staying here? I got my, my, my money back from, from losing my job for that year. And they're going to go, I'm going out on my terms now. And it's happening across the nation. So Correct. there's another job opening out yeah. there. I mean, and that's where I, that's why, I mean, I wanted to leave because I enjoyed what I did. And then I just got to a point where I'm like, I enjoy this more. And I just went, you know, have a good, great day and shake hands and go on your own. Karen. Yeah. So when you were talking about the paradigm shifts and, and what's that saying, uh, Joshua, help me out where, um, where it's good men and weak uh, yeah, times so and weak good times. Men, weak men create hard times, hard times. Uh, hard times create strong men. Strong men uh, create good times. Good times create weak, weak men. men. And weak men create hard times. Right. So it's, it's, cycle. This, cycle. it's this cycle that somebody looked at the decades in the past, right? Since the 18, late 1800s um, where policing first started, right? I mean, who, why are we doing this? It's because when you're, we're only here for 100 years, right? And another 100 years, none of us are going to be here. So it's almost like, why do we care? Why do the high level politicians care about what ha- they, they're elitist, right? That let's face it, they don't do they don't go to the gas station like we do. So why do they care if there's a shooting like the Atlanta? Did you see they that? They don't care. They don't care that no. we're being robbed. They don't care that we want to protect ourselves and our family. They don't care about that. So it just it always boggles my mind. But when you talk about the the decades and how it changes, like the broken window theory, we can't talk about Giuliani because it'll trigger everybody. But he's the one that came up with the broken window theory in New, New York. York. He fixed New York he where did. people. So is it a bigger thing? I, I, it really. I get very philosophical about it, so I, I don't know if I can even answer these questions without going down the rabbit hole, but it's like, is it a bigger, is it is it about the economy? Is it about tourism? Is it about, you know, you couldn't go to New York, you couldn't go to Broadway and, and go see a show, and then they cleaned it up, and then it was one of the best places well, to go on the planet. Times Square was was prostitutes yeah, and porn shops. Same with Chicago. Like, uh, yeah, right. there was a strip. It was called Skid Row, and my dad was a street cop. And I remember even when I was hired, I still, they had to do, I had to go and do um, the female searches. Um, because they weren't sure i know and so i caught the i caught the tail end of that you know and it's it's just it's so crazy how we can't just keep it up right the gentrification of these cities where it was skid row and and do you call them bums anymore i don't know homeless we're living in these beautiful brownstone homes in chicago and then i got to see it all cleaned up and now it's going back that why why do why does it happen that way you know and i get the ebbs and flow of things i get that you know when feast and famine but it was such a stark destruction of police. It was such a stark destruction of the uh, bail system where people were revolving door. All, there is no magic bullet, in my humble opinion. There is no quick fix to something that was on so many levels. It's a big problem, and it's going to take a big amount of time to turn it around. And right. effort. Right. Well, the and s- effort. Exactly. The street cops are the ones that are doing all Paying the work. the price. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, please, Robin. Wow, last I, one. I just really got caught up in all of that. Right? You guys, right? I love, I love what they're talking about. But here we go. Here's another thing. Texas mother paralyzed after vicious robbery. Texas going tough on no bail law. Yeah, this is again. Uh, we talked about the paradigm shift from t- 2020. I believe we're in the midst of a paradigm shift as it relates to the public. I think the public is really tired. The The politicians aren't there yet. They're only there um, when it becomes a fallen officer. They'll, you know, they'll m- get some air time and, and make some nice statement about how much they care about these four officers and when they don't care. Uh, they, they, they've, they're not there, but I think the public is. The reason I, I say is we've seen some of these these crimes that are just absolutely horrendous, like this, um, this young mother. She's a single mother. Her husband died of liver cancer uh so now she has three kids uh she is going to a atm takes out a large sum of money then she i think she goes in the bank takes some more money out because she's going on this trip with her family to back to i want to say korea when this guy is stalking her he's clearly targeting her and he just doesn't take her stuff 
he then throws her to the ground with such ugliness. And, and if you've seen the video, you probably haven't seen the video. You've seen pieces of it. But the part where he literally does a um, like a world wrestling move and throws her to the ground and did some damage to her spine, and now she's paralyzed. Uh, at this point, hopefully, modern medicine being what it is, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, she will get the ability to, to walk in. I absolutely pray for her. Um, but I think... The more we see these things, the more we put these things out, and and if you have a news outlet that's not playing it, then dump that news outlet. We need to see these things. It's like Denzel Washington once said: if you're watching, if you're not watching the news, you're not informed. If you are watching the news, you're misinformed. <laughs> oh. uh, it's a great line, oh, okay. and it's so true. So if, if you don't you know what I'm talking about out there, you need to change your. I don't care what you listen to, where you get your news, but get real news and don't get agenda based news. Um, this was this hit home with me, but the thing that I like about it is Texas, not certain areas of Texas like Austin, but Texas as a whole is saying we're done with the bail thing. We're done with this. We're going to be we're going to go back to, if you will, what you're talking about, Karen, in terms of some tough laws to have true consequences, which is how New York was straightened out in the first place. And we need to do that again, because I'm sure this is the first time he's ever done this. Exactly. Right. I'm sure he no. doesn't have a criminal record. Of course. Not. I mean, he's and sadly, he's still out. So we, you know, all the, and again, I know we, you know, sarcasm there. Yeah, that's truly appreciated. Yeah, it's just because we need to catch him. And you're right, we will see a extensive. Correct. And if he was from Austin, then we'll see a lot of that that exactly bail return where he goes in, and gets out, and, and I, that's that's not reform. That's criminal empowerment. Absolutely, and and like the the the, the fact of the remains is what are prisons? Prisons are and jails are bipedal predator zoos. No, no, like if you want to see predators, quadrupedal predators, you go to the, like the Phoenix Zoo, for example, like these are predators on, in our community. And sometimes there's no other way of dealing with that and besides if, locking them up and, and, and keeping them away from society. That, and that's if, what you have to do. And if government's number one job, number one job, correct, is to protect you. Correct. They're failing. Yeah. Karen. Yeah. Karen. Yeah, so um, I think there's, across the country, there's a large group of people that feel that the system is unfair, right? And again, going back to the media, it's just this pumping of information into the airwaves that it's unfair when it really just comes down to law and order. You know, when you were a kid and you did something wrong, your parents punished you for it, and you learned not to do that. And that's what, again, it, again, I get philosophical. We're only here for a short time, so what are we doing to one another? You know, why are we not punishing people who are outright just causing horrific harm to others that are just trying to live a life like it, it's just crazy to me and i think you know it goes back to what you're saying about the the um the da's um they're the ones that are listening to that demographic of people right um and i don't know if it's, maybe it's split down the middle that things are unfair and we have to punish the police and we have to let these people go and give them a chance but there's a point in time where you have to draw the line and go enough's enough you're a bad guy, you're a criminal, yeah. and you need to be punished for it, sadly. You know, do I want to pay for people in prison? No, because then that becomes another, you know, another issue. It becomes sure. another world in there, and it's there's still a lot of illegal activity. But, you know, do we put everyone to death because they, you know, because they stole a candy bar? No, but we, there has there to could be, be a measured approach. Uh, yeah, and, and once they are in prison or are in jail more more prison than jail there's got to be rehabilitation we sure. need to put emphasis on that it's or either re recidivism or right. it's or, rehabilitation. or you just lock you have to lock them away and, and they there's there's no there's no rehabilitation there, like, on some i'm sorry like no, I'm, sorry, if i grab you if i grab you by your ankles and i hold you over a lion cage and that lion hasn't eaten for a month and i drop you in there and then you fall down there and you stare at the lion are you going to have a logical conversation with that lion and here's what i love about Bad boys, because we can agree to disagree, and I do it with Jason all the time. When it comes to prisons, they are great training ground. Oh, absolutely. And we're, we're, we're taking a new prisoner who's maybe committed a horrible crime, sure. right? And now he's in prison. We can turn that around, or we can just let him sit there and be trained by the house. Oh, yeah. And, and that's where we need to have rehabilitation. Yep. And I, that's why there are some predators— Sexual prayer, perfect example. You're not going to rehabilitate them in the terms of their mindset. Yes. You can rehabilitate them in terms of their actions. I like that. 
Really, that's a that's a, that's a valid point. One hundred percent. That was a wonderful uh, <laughs> cop talk segment. Uh, um, Cops and Robin. I, I, do you agree? Oh, I agree. I I love these two. I just love how open and and I love your philosophicalness. I yeah, love that. Yeah. If that's a word, philosophicalness. Yeah. Yeah, I love I think that. So yeah. yeah. Sometimes go I go it. down the rabbit hole, but it's okay. That's where my mind goes. <laughs> um, that wraps it up for our uh, Cops and Robin. We're going to be right back with our last segment, at the Stupid Suspects, Heroic Headline, and an inspirational closing message. We'll be right back. More stories, inside guests, and true blue humor coming up on Batch Boys. We'll be back right after this. During these challenging days, we not only need to remember our many fallen heroes for their ultimate sacrifice, but also honor them so their families know we've not forgotten. And that's what the Arizona Fallen Hero Memorial Riders Organization is all about. Each year, the nonprofit organizes three memorial rides among the beautiful backdrop of North, South, and Central Arizona, with the proceeds going to the 100 Club of Arizona. Learn more about these fun rides and how you can honor all of Arizona's fallen heroes at ArizonaFallenHeroesMemorialRiders.org. You're listening to Batch Boys with retired police sergeant Darren Birch and retired police officer Jason Schechterly. Now, back to the Batch Boys. That was such a nice conversation. It, it was. really was. Jason missed out, dude. I know, I know. And and I like having, you know, uh, the marriage team, you know, yeah. kind of weighing in. One down, down the middle, the other philosophical. It was awesome. I loved it. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. Well, thank for that. you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and now I uh, don't have uh, Jason to kind of raise my 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 heights of humanity. Uh, talk about he takes it <laughs> so to the can... heart of humanity. So I, I I have to go to Robin, who is also equally equipped for the task. Yeah, oh, I don't know about that one, but I will try to fill in Jason's shoes. This one is about actually. My hometown? This Is this really Miami, Florida? It is. Okay, I just so that everybody understands, I've said it before, and if you've forgotten, I was born in Miami Beach, Florida. Even though I am a desert dweller, at the age of three, we moved here. So here is about Miami. Miami police officer rescues man attempting suicide in Miami River. A Miami police officer was caught on video risking his life to save another life at the Miami River. Veteran officer Lucas, pardon me if I screw this up, Pereira and his department shared the story. I made a decision to jump in, said Pereira. It happened Saturday afternoon when a 911 call came in about a man attempting to kill himself. The man had cut himself. We were dispatched to a call reference possible homeless male with sores on his body. His internal organs were exposed. He was acting erratically, perhaps attempting to commit suicide. That man in distress then plunged into the river at Spring Garden Point Park. We began rescue efforts to get him out of the water and that didn't work, said Pereira. So at that point, I decided to take my uniform off. Officer Pereira selflessly and immediately took action, said Miami Police Chief Manny Morales. Morales said Officer Pereira jumping in to stop a suicide is an example of the gutsy, compassionate work his men and women do every day, much of which, he said, goes unnoticed. Well, we know that. He definitely put his life on the line, said Morales. After going through that emotionally impactful incident, He's able to dry off, get cleaned up, and get back on the road to service the citizens of Miami with dignity, compassion, and respect. The city of Miami, we're a very fast-paced department, so we've been exposed to a lot of situations over here, said Pereira. He's going to get a life-saving award that comes along with eight hours of compensatory time, said Morales. Only eight hours. Give him a vacation somewhere. Pereira also wanted to acknowledge two other Miami officers who helped him get the man out of the water as well as a pedestrian who helped out. Now, that's teamwork. So, Officer Lucas Pereira, sorry if I butchered that name. Dude, you are our hero of the day. Thank you for what you do above and beyond wearing that badge. Well, well said. And again, you take us to the heart of heroism. I'm going to take us to the bowels of humanity. We have our stupid suspect stories. All right. The first one, again, you uh, made Florida look really good. I'm going to make them look real bad. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Do we need that song? Uh, We do. We have some Uh. stupid Florida men. 
Everyone from Florida is stupid. Everyone from Florida is dumb. I might not be the brightest guy, but next to them, my IQ's high. It's so true, too. Uh, this is Palm Beach. A Florida man was arrested March 8th for indecent exposure after a female restaurant worker saw him taking a naked stroll outside the restaurant. Uh, when Palm Beach police officers arrived to the scene, several people pointed out the subject very quickly. Uh, they identified Jason Smith walking nearby, again, stark-ass naked. The officers also saw him walking with no clothes on as well, uh, with his penis fully exposed act- and acting like a dick. No, it's true. <laughs> Officer Smith said uh, he, he did not know where his uh, uh, he didn't know where his clothes was. He refused to give him his date of birth. He just wasn't playing nice. He was finally booked, and at that point, he eventually gave up his name. But he still would not give up his social security number, stating that he was from a different Earth where they didn't use social security numbers. So I, yeah, maybe, maybe. Why true. is Who it knows? always a dude? It is. It's always a Florida man. It always, always starts a with dude. a Florida man. Because it does. Because boys. Are, no, I won't say it. I won't say it. Well, I, won't, I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't argue this. I can't. There's no argument I can make on that. Uh, again, a Florida man on story two stole close to half a million dollars worth of crab by pretending he was a grocery store representative. Federal prosecutors said that David Sobiel identified himself as a representative of Safeway and had sent fake purchase orders that apparently didn't look fishy. Uh, the California <laughs> Seafood Company, yep. Uh, the prosecutor said he ordered more than $400,000 worth of king crab uh, and was the, the shipment was sent to Washington. Uh, there, Subal rented a rider truck to pick up the seafood. Uh, despite the payment didn't go through, he still got the, the because there was no payment, uh, he got the, the crab and then he drove it to... You're right, Florida. Oh, uh, it, yep, he drove Florida, uh, <laughs> and that's where he was finally caught. Uh, he had some co-conspirators, and there's a little bit more to the story, but the whole thing seems fishy to me. I really <laughs> does. I'm going with there. Quit being okay. crabby. Uh, thank you. Thank Stop you. Being crabby. Thank you. Uh, story three. And how's it begin, Karen? Say again. How does story three begin? A Florida man a Florida was arrested Florida man. <laughs> Florida man. Florida. in Tarpon. Kind of looks like Tampon Springs, but it's not. Uh, after hiding his phone in the men's restroom. That's how I knew it was a tampon. Uh, the coffee shop, by the way, is called We Spy Coffee and More. I guess this got the pervert employee uh, to decide he was going to hide his phone in the washroom there under a sink and have the camera aimed at the toilet what a shitty thing to do the men's restroom yeah yeah Ew. this guy was a pervert and he liked uh, he liked men he wa- liked watching men shit uh quote it was an iphone that was propped underneath the sink and it was upside down the customer picked up the phone and saw that it was actually actually making a video recording uh the the guy uh mr volcarcus and i again i butchered Ca- that but that's Ca- a good thing carcass. we'll just call him uh ugly carcass bull coffee uh, yeah, he, he, uh, <laughs> the, the customer was, well, actually it was Ugly Carcass. Uh, he was pissed when he saw that somebody had picked up his phone. So he went to the bathroom, grabbed the phone, and assaulted this poor victim. Um, he got to try to get his phone back. Uh, detectives got involved. After inspecting the phone, they said it looked like there were more victims, but um, they'll need those victims to come forward because you can't identify their butts. Um, <laughs> if you, so if, if you happen to be in, uh, where was this, Tampon Springs, Florida? <laughs> if you're there and uh, around February 13th and you were in the We Spy Coffee, yeah, you got spied on, and you may want to talk to Detective Jay Melton with the Tarpon Springs Police Department. And that is the Stupid Suspect Stories. You know, I got to say something, Darren, before you read that last bit. It's fun when we have a gallery of people here when we do the Stupid Suspects. It kind of adds adds a whole different level of fun to it. So we're going to crack that case wide open. Oh, nice, (laughs) nice, (laughs) nice. Have you seen I, this crack? I, <laughs> I love your backdoor approach on that. Crack. Loved it. Loved it. Uh, oh, this is going to be a very unusual, inspirational closing message. Uh, generally, um, Jason does it, and it's heart-wrenching half the time, uh, and then just tear-jerking the other half. Uh, this is a little bit different. Uh, this is an unusual, inspirational story about a mystery hero, Oklahoma City police officer Terry Yeeke. 
He was also a military veteran and saved at least three people from the rubble that was the Alfred P. Murray Federal Building, which was bombed on April 19, 1995, killing 168 people and injuring hundreds more. The Oklahoma City Police Department planned to give Officer Yehi a Medal of Valor for his actions on the day of the bombing. And yet, Officer Yehi did not want the Medal of Valor. By any reasonable standard, he deserved it for saving no less, no less than three people, one of which I will chronicle now. Not long after the horrific explosion, a maintenance worker lay under the rubble, willing himself to stay conscious. His name was Randy Ledger. Broken glass had pierced his carotid artery and his juggler vein. Part of his face was missing. Literally half his face was gone. Ledger had been cleaning light fixtures, you see, in the Federal Building Child Care Center minutes before the bombing went off. Now trapped by debris and bleeding to death, Ledger felt a strange weight on his lower body. He was buried so deeply that someone had stepped on his legs without even knowing he was there. That someone turned out to be Yiki, the police officer who was about to save his life. Yiki was 29 years old then, tall and muscular, well known among his colleagues for his strength and determination. On his way back up, uh, on one particular time, um, <laughs> he was on a burglary in progress call and his car broke down. He got out of his pro car. And again, it was 100 degrees out, and Yiki got out and ran the rest of the way to make that backup. That's determination. Another time when an angry crowd surrounded Yiki and a colleague, uh, and the ringleader tried to grab the officer's badge, Yiki picked up that suspect, quote, wadded him up like a paper sack and threw him to the ground. The other officer, Larry Sprill, recalled the rest of the mob quickly dispersed. You see, Yiki was one of the first officers in the ruins of the federal building after the explosion. And he'd already saved at least two other people before he stumbled upon Randy Ledger. Yiki called for other officers and rescuers, and together they tugged and pulled Ledger out and helped him onto a backboard to safety. Ledger drifted in and out of consciousness. Minutes later, he awoken in the ambulance, and he saw Yiki next to him. You see, Yiki was also being treated because during that time frame that Ledger was coming in and out of consciousness. He was helping others and had succumbed to an injury falling off of a, a deck. Ledger needed 12 pints of blood and multiple surgeries to repair his face. He recently turned 66, and he still thinks of the bombing almost every day. Little things bring the memories back. Musty smells, a news report, just a yellow truck on the highway. And when Ledger recalls the bombing, he sometimes thinks of Terry Yiki, the officer who saved his life. And he feels great gratitude and profound sadness. Why? Because something happened to Officer Yiki in those hours in the federal building wreckage. He was badly shaken, and his whole worldview seemed to change in time. He grew suspicious of his supervisors. He ran afoul of them. He went on secret quote-unquote missions going unaccounted for for long periods of time, withholding his actions even from his fellow officers. And then, 385 days after that bombing, his dead body was found near some trees in a field off a country road. His wrists were cut. His neck was cut. He'd been shot through the head. The medical examiner ruled his death a suicide. You see, Officer Yiki's car was found abandoned near an adjacent county on May 8, 1996, a year and a month after that bombing. According to a sheriff's report, the car was locked and the windows were rolled up. A deputy looked inside and saw a Bible, an empty gun holster, a razor blade, and a large amount of blood on the seats. Yiki's body was eventually found about a half mile away. The medical examiner's report noted, quote, multiple superficial wounds to his wrists and neck. The report listed the probable cause of death as self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. If the prevailing narrative is correct, he cut his wrists, his arms, and his neck with a razor blade, bled heavily in the car, and then went about half a mile into a field where he f shot himself to death. And though the official manner of death is suicide, many of those who knew Terry Yiki, especially those who knew him before that horrific event, believed he had to have been murdered. They couldn't believe that he would have taken his own life. Yiki's death is now mostly a mystery, at least to many. But what, we, but what isn't a mystery is that an Oklahoma City bombing hero died a little over a year after that horrific day. The mystery isn't why he was hurting. It's why we couldn't get him help. 
There's now a hotline for those in such pain. It's 988. We need to inspire all those around us to spread information about this hotline, this number that will save lives so we don't lose more heroes to a mysterious death or suicide. And that is my inspirational closing message to you. If you know anyone who's a police officer, uh, first responder, nurse, medic, anyone out there that is hurting, let them know about 988. We don't need any more deaths. Um, And that is an inspirational closing message. I'm sorry for that downer. Uh, It was a sad one. And usually Jason uplifts us. Uh, So I will say this uh, in closing. Thank you for uh, Josh and Karen to come out here. Thank you for what you do with Guardian uh, Training and Consulting. Uh, Thank you for still, after a lifetime of career of service to in the military, um, police, the air marshal, the federal, Chicago, you're still helping society. It's in our DNA. And thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to thank uh, Rock and Robin Cote, our producer, who always is the brains of the outfit. <laughs> but most of all, I want to thank you, the listening audience, because without you, there is no Badge Boy. So until next week, stay safe. Badge Boy. Thanks for listening to Badge Boys. <laughs> Stories, insights, guests, and true blue humor with retired police sergeant Darren Birch and retired police officer Jason Schechterly. Badge Boys, heard weekly and worldwide on Star Worldwide Networks and all mobile devices. Badge Boys.